Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Courtside View Basketball Webcast. This is Tribune Sports Editor Joe Wall Jasper along with Tribune Basketball Beat Writer, the long-suffering Steve Wolentic. Steve, Missouri now on an 11-game losing streak. Looks like this one might continue throughout the offseason unless the Tigers figure out a way to pull an upset. Let's sort of discuss how we got here. Um, I think maybe the biggest problem that this program has had is their inability in recent past to recruit freshmen who can help them and to retain freshmen who could help them. Uh, why has that been such an issue and maybe take us a, a walk back in time at some of the names that fans may have forgotten? I think the, the, you know, the retention part especially needs to be talked about because you know, over the last three years, well, actually, over the last two years, Missouri had brought in uh, a total of eight freshmen, three of whom are still on the roster two years later. So uh, that that's that that really robs you of a, any sort of upper class. Uh, and you know that's certainly the situation Missouri's in, where they've got four upperclassmen on their roster, and one of them is a or two of them are transfers, uh, and one's a junior college transfer. So three of them are transfers. So you know that's that's tough to do. You have you don't have continuity in your program. There there were guys that look like they could be promising, like Negus Webster Chan, and uh, Stefan Yankovic, and for various reasons, you know they were unhappy and, and left. I, I think Negus was a guy who, who started a lot of the game his freshman year, but I thought he got every opportunity and just didn't do much with it. He did once Jabari Brown became eligible that year. I think uh, you know he got phased out a little bit, his, his numbers went down, he decided to transfer, he's playing at Hawaii now, and he started 17 games this season. Um, he obviously, he's not lighting the world on fire, but he, 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 he's contributing to a Division One program that has a winning record. You know, if he stuck it out, maybe he could help them, but I don't think he's a program-changing player. I think Jankovic didn't really get a, a, a ton of opportunity. You know, he was playing behind um, Alex Oriaki and Lawrence Bowers are, you know, during his freshman year. Missouri never really seemed to be able to find a position for him. Um, he seemed like he wanted to be a, a small forward, even though he mm -hmm. was 6'10", 6 6'11". 6 um, he's playing actually pretty well at Hawaii right now. Um, I think he's averaging almost 10 points a game and four rebounds and shooting, you know, 38% from three-point range, but not just taking threes, which he seemed to like to do a lot of. You know, he couldn't guard mm -hmm. very well at Missouri, and that was an issue. Um, so, you know, I think those guys had potential to be contributors. I think Torrin Jones did, but he was dismissed because of off-the-court situation. Um, then, you know, you look at another guy who, who left, Dominique Bull, you, you wonder why Missouri recruited him in, at all. You know, he left Missouri after scoring a, a total of one point in nine games, and mm -hmm. I, I, I think he probably has to be in the running for the least productive scholarship player in Missouri's had. I mean, uh, it, it, that's hard to do. Um, you know, obviously he didn't get much of an opportunity, but they they were seeing him in practice, and he wasn't showing anything to to make them think that he could help them. So I don't know why they misevaluated him that badly during the recruiting process. And really, I think you could probably say the same thing about Shane Rector, who uh, left after Kim Anderson was hired. You know, he didn't really do much last year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had some nice moments in a double overtime win against Texas A&M uh, after Jordan Clarkson and Jabari Brown fouled out. But, you know, he was a late signee after um, a coaching change at Rutgers. Uh, Missouri was kind of desperate for, for guard help, and um, so they brought him in. But, you know, he didn't get a ton of opportunity and didn't really show that he was able to contribute much and, and so he left and I, I think you know you can't have that many of those kind of mistakes. Well I think when Frank Haith came in uh, his reputation was as a pretty good recruiter. He had recruited talented people at Miami. Um, I think what hurt him obviously right off the bat is NCAA mm -hmm. uh, investigation into him within a few months of him being on the job. So some of these guys to me smack of we need someone to fill out the roster. Mostly we're taking transfers, but we'll take a chance on a few guys. And uh, so then you, in that case, you're almost better off that they transfer them to stay four years if they're just mm -hmm. not going to play at all. But like you said, I thought you would like to be able to retain, I thought a guy like Yankovic, that's Yankovic, I guess you would mm -hmm. say, that, that's that big and can shoot the ball a little bit. Um, he's a guy that you'd like to be able to hang on to. Mm -hmm. um, 
Probably the same for Webster Chan, uh, but I was not as enamored of him. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, again, I, don't, I think he's a guy who could be part of your rotation. He's not a guy who's leading your team. But, you know, if, if your rotation is as thin as Missouri's has really been uh, this season, they could use somebody like that, and they couldn't keep him around. And, you know, part of that is he was a, he was a more heralded, recruited kid. Uh, at one point, he was committed to Louisville. And uh, so I, I think he had an expectation of, of, of having a big role in college. And certainly, he wasn't going to play last season ahead of, uh, you know, Clarkson, Brown, or Ernest Ross. He just wasn't as good as those guys. Um, you were going to have to convince him to be patient. Um, and, and to you know, be ready to, to be a bigger role player as a, as a junior, and, and that obviously didn't happen. This even goes back further than Frank Haith, though. Um, it does. You look at the, in 2011, they didn't sign any uh, mm-hmm. freshmen at all. They were just two. It was Keon Bell and uh, one of the transfer. 2011 was a little bit uh, misleading in that you know, they had the coaching change, and they went into that fall with, with one scholarship open, and then they picked up two more because... Uh, you know, John Underwood decided to transfer, and 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 Tony Mitchell was was not eligible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Missouri didn't find that out until January, so they went from one to three uh, that like in the middle of that season. And I, I think certainly Mike Anderson's staff looked like they were targeting Otto Porter mm-hmm. for the one, um, and obviously didn't get him uh, to commit early. And uh, he ends up going to Georgetown after the coaching change. But you know, the year before that, they took. Kadeem Flyers, Green. They took they took a flyer on Kadeem Green and uh, that didn't work out. The year before that, they they took a flyer on John Underwood and and another one on Tyler Stone and, and Tyler Stone probably could have helped him actually. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. yeah. I mean, you saw the player he became at, at at Southeast Missouri State. Missouri got a chance to play him a couple of times later in his career, and he you know he wasn't he's another guy maybe like Webster Chan who wasn't going to be a star mm-hmm. uh, probably though better than Webster Chan and what he became and certainly could have helped. Um, he was, a, he was a late signee, and, um, you know, I think Mike Anderson hadn't done a good enough job, clearly, of, of, of building off of the success of the 2009 Elite Eight run, and, and, and so it was kind of sc- scrambling late, and um, I don't think they really saw eye-to-eye with Tyler during the time that uh, mm-hmm. he was, was on campus. Yeah, so that's how, you know, th- those players were mentioning that may have come in a little bit handy, you know. Not that they were going to make Missouri a winning team, but when you look at a but team that's provide more stability yeah. and 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 you know make it easier to fill out a roster year to year, mm-hmm. so you weren't scrambling again and again and again, and that's certainly the rut that this program has been in. And every time you have a mass exodus of these transfers, then you're just having to fill up spots, and maybe you're just taking flyers on guys, which and then mm-hmm. they don't they're not good enough, so then they leave, and it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Uh, so we'll see if they can retain the current freshmen they have now. Not that they've been lighting the world on fire either, but I think they're guys that they certainly would like to keep them all, and hopefully, and guys who could develop. They could and develop. That's, that's the thing is, I, I think what happens too too much in college basketball is you look at how a guy plays as a freshman, and you expect that because they're impact freshmen at Duke or they're impact freshmen at Kentucky that if a guy's going to be good, you're going to see it as freshman year, and that really is not the way it works. I, at, almost everywhere um, you know most guys take a couple of years to, to become good players and um, you know I think these guys have a chance to do that as well um, but it's going to be important for Missouri to, to hold on to them and, 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 and work with them and get them better. Um, there was a story in USA Today last week about Frank Haith and most of the story was about Frank and his relationship with his sister who's ill um, it was kind of a feel-good story there was a line in there, however, towards the end, mentioning that uh, he felt when he left last year that this was a team that he could win 20 games with, which I think caught the attention of a lot of us because mm. it seemed sort of outrageous. Your thoughts on that statement, um, whether in, is there any way you can put it together in your head where if Frank stays, this is a team that wins 20 games? Well, as, as far as, it, it's a little weird to talk about the statement because it was it was paraphrased. It, we, we don't know exactly what, what his quote was, but the idea that he had a, he felt he had a roster that could win 20 games this year at Missouri just doesn't jive at all with the fact that he left Missouri mm-hmm. to go to Tulsa. Um, I mean, it's clearly a, a program with less tradition, 
uh, less recent success um, in a worse league. Um, you know, he, he's, he's suggesting in the story or it's suggested in the story that he was interested in more job security. He still had three years left on his contract here. Um, I, I think he knew that he was going to have to win this year because there was the heat was building um, because, you know, Missouri went from a team that went 30 and five his first year, uh, but obviously had the biggest of all letdowns with the loss to Norfolk State. Um, you know, they had a, a pretty good year his next year, but were kind of unraveling at the end. You know, there were some injuries in there. Um, they didn't have enough ball handlers other than Phil Pressey, and I think that hurt them. But uh, the way that they went out in the NCAA tournament against Colorado State was was not good for anyone. Mm -hmm. And then last year... You know, year, good for Colorado State. <laughs> and, then, and then you, uh, you know, last year you have a team that, yes, they won 23 games, but they had the leading scorer in the SEC. They had a guy who's playing for the Lakers now, uh, and they only went 9-9 nine and nine in a, a weak SEC. Um, didn't make the NCAA tournament, snapping a streak of five straight years, you know, in that, in that event. And, um, you know, really deserve to lose to, to Southern Miss at home. Uh, and then we're going to lose their two best players, really three best players. So uh, I think things were not on an upward trajectory. And I, I think Frank Kaith knew that, which is one of the reasons he invited us all out for pizza <laughs> last April to, uh, to I, it, it seemed like, you know, try to win some support heading mm -hmm. into the season. Yeah, now the roster would have looked a little different if it had he stayed. You could probably see him not kicking Cam Beach out of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he would have had to kick Torrin Jones off the team regardless. Uh, probably doesn't get Techie Gil Caesar, obviously, because he but would. He, but he does get Kevin Punter, yeah. who uh, you know is a guy who's contributing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he's, he's still Tennessee's, I believe, second leading scorer, and uh, and would be an older guy that you know probably could have helped Missouri get a couple more wins. But boy, I don't see 20 wins. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the difference between, I mean, seven and, and you know, seven and 18 and, um, and 20 wins right now or, or headed to 20 wins is, is huge. Um, I, you know, Cam Beach, I played a whole year at Notre Dame and again, freshmen get better. Um, but, you know, you average six points a game. Um, and, it, it, you know, it wasn't like people were lining up to, to to take him when he, he left Missouri. Uh, you know, I, at last report, he's headed to Jacksonville State. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, Missouri was clearly counting on him to be their leading scorer this year. Frank Haith said it, Cam said it. Was he ready to do that? I don't know. I mean, I still think Jonathan Williams is probably a better player. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like a, a, a pretty big leap uh, that Frank is making. Yeah, and you don't really know the context. Maybe the guy just asked him in the story, do you think you would have been able to win at Missouri? And he just says, oh, yeah, 20 games. Or you don't know if, or if it was an intentional jab trying to kind of stick the knife in mm -hmm. to Kim Anderson. Regardless, uh, last week, in addition to the two losses, Missouri, really the guy who'd been playing the best for him, the SEC play, Wes Clark, has kind of a garish elbow injury. He's out for the season now. How does that affect what Missouri's doing with their lineups, and how does it affect the possibility of them ending this losing streak before the season ends? I, I mean, I, clearly it's a, it's a blow to their chances of winning because I, I think you're right. West was, had become Missouri's best player in SEC play. You know, obviously Jonathan Williams had a, a really strong second half against Mississippi State and still had the potential to, to be that guy the rest of the way. But, uh, you know, West was the leading scorer. He's averaging almost 12 points a game in, in conference play and three assists. You know, he had an 18-point game. He had a 19-point game. Um, I thought defensively he, he'd made an impact. Uh, he'd become kind of a pest, you know, a guy who could steal the ball and, and, and really was a, a shutdown defender against Arkansas in the first meeting where he was guarding Michael Qualls mm -hmm. and giving up quite a bit of size to him, but really frustrated a guy who, uh, you know, some people think has an NBA game. Um, so I, I think he, it hurts them to not have him – in a number of different ways. Uh, maybe the biggest, though, is that there just aren't a lot of ball handlers on this roster. And, um, you know, Keith Schamberger was already playing about 36 minutes a game mm -hmm. in SEC play. Uh, he barely came off the floor against Mississippi State. And I think that's going to be the way Missouri is going to have to finish this season because, uh, you know, we saw when their other guards, especially with Tremaine Isabel's uh, status still in limbo, 
their other guards, Naaman Wright and, and Monte Gil Caesar, when, when they handle it, they tend to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Naaman had two really costly turnovers down the stretch against Mississippi State that I thought affected the Tigers' chance to, to get a win uh, when they'd really put themselves in position to do that. Uh, so it's, it's a tough situation in, in a lot of different areas to not have him. They did, the one advantage of playing bigger was they did rebound a lot better mm -hmm. On that game Saturday, um, D'Angelo Allen I thought was pretty active. Did a pretty good job in that game. He's kind of hit or miss, but when he's active, he can be helpful. He's been better the last couple games too. You see, he seems like he might be coming on a little bit. Yeah, he may have hit the wall and has regrouped and climbed yeah. over it. But uh, so they do have a little bigger lineup um, for what that's worth. So you could maybe rebound a little more. But I think the ball handling is a bigger issue for them. They have enough trouble on offense. Um, I think their offense maybe is now going to become some sort of volleyball match where they just try to get it on the rim and maybe you can get a rebound. But they're still not a huge team regardless. Right, and not, I mean, they're still the worst rebounding team, I think, by differential in the SEC. And uh, Yeah, I mean, that, it's not like something that's been a weakness is all of a sudden mm -hmm. going to become a strength. It's, it's just another weakness probably becomes weaker. On that high note... That wraps up another webcast. Join us again next week.